It's Wednesday, the 3rd of July. My name's Juan Brown, and you're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And today we're discussing the recent King Air crash in Addison, Texas, that took the lives of all 10 souls on board. On Sunday, 30 June, a late model 2017 King Air 350i departed Addison Airport on an IFR flight plan for St. Petersburg, Florida and crashed shortly after takeoff, veering well to the left of the runway, rolling nearly inverted and into a hangar just 4,000 feet down the runway. The NTSB in their second press briefing has informed us that they have access to three separate surveillance, airport surveillance videos from three different angles of the accident. They have several eyewitness reports, including pilot eyewitness report, one pilot reporting that it appeared as if the aircraft was flying at a very low speed, was not producing sufficient power, and it appeared to have stalled upon crashing into the hangar. The 2017 King Air 350i had recently changed hands and was currently owned by EE Operations LLC. The flight was conducted under Part 91 operations. Part 91 is general aviation, the same part that all of us fly under, our small aircraft, meaning that it was not a flight for hire, it was not a Part 135 charter flight, and it certainly was not a Part 121 airline operation scheduled flight. Along with the video evidence and the eyewitness reports, the King Air 350 was equipped with a CVR cockpit voice recorder with 30 minutes of data, 30 minutes of cap data capability. The NTSB has recovered that information. And regarding the CVR data, the exact transcript from the CVR, though the NTSB has that information, they will not release the complete transcript until the interim report. Most NTSB reports take anywhere from a year and a half to two years to complete and the interim report is usually only released about halfway through that time period. Only then will we get the complete transcript of the CVR, the, the cockpit voice recorder. But some preliminary information released by the NTSB seems to indicate that there was some confusion regarding an engine failure on this flight. Aircraft was found in the hangar, burned nearly beyond all recognition. However, they were able to determine that the landing gear were still down in the down position, extended position. And they were able to also, the NTSB that is, was also able to determine that the entire aircraft made it to the scene of the accident. In other words, something didn't fall off of the aircraft bef before it hit the hangar. Even though this King Air was operated under FAR Part 91, general aviation rules, because the King Air has a max gross weight over 12,500 pounds and it's also a turbojet, the FAA requires that the pilot in command have a type rating in that aircraft. And this is something that the NTSB will be looking at closely as this aircraft recently changed hands, so they'll be looking closely at the pilot's training record. The hangar that the aircraft hit was a privately owned hangar and inside that hangar was a, a Falcon jet and a helicopter. Now let's do a broad overview about takeoff procedures in multi-engine aircraft. In a single engine aircraft like the mighty Luscombe here, your takeoff decision making process is pretty straightforward. Either the engine runs fine and you continue on with your flight or you have an engine problem and if that engine problem results in an engine failure, you're going to have to land. You can either land straight ahead or if you have enough altitude, you can attempt to return to the airport. Very difficult maneuver to perform at low altitude and low air speeds. Your best bet is finding a clear area off the end of the runway and stuffing the airplane in there, something soft, cheap, and flat. On a twin-inch multi-engine aircraft, you have to go through an entire decision process that is basically mathematically calculated for each takeoff. Let's review some of those basics. And this holds true for major airline aircraft as well. Each takeoff, whether it's in a single engine or a multi-engine aircraft, starts with a crew briefing. You need to talk to each other, or if you're flying by yourself, you need to even brief yourself about what is your plan in the event of an emergency on takeoff. 
Once the briefing is completed on a multi-engine aircraft, you roll out onto the runway, you get your takeoff clearance, and you advance your power. You can either do a standing uh, takeoff where you run the power up to nearly full power, check all the engine gauges, and then release the brakes and depart. Or you can do a rolling takeoff where you just roll onto the runway, advance the power, and start flying down the runway. One of the first things you need to verify is that the airspeed indicator is working correctly, airspeed alive. On airline type aircraft, you need to verify that both airspeeds are alive and that they both match. The first speed that you need to attain that has been calculated for this, for every specific takeoff, that is they're taking into account the runway distance, density, altitude, weight of the aircraft, that first speed that you need to achieve is V1, your takeoff decision speed. This is the maximum speed that you can roll down the runway at, decide to reject the takeoff or stop the takeoff, and stop the aircraft in the amount of runway remaining. V1, takeoff decision speed. Again, that speed is calculated for every takeoff from every runway. Shortly after V1, you'll reach rotate speed. Rotate means that point at which the pilot pulls back on the stick and flies away from the ground. At this point in twin engine aircraft, V1 rotate occurs just a little bit before your best single engine rate of climb speed or blue line. But the aircraft is accelerating quickly and generally will quickly achieve that speed, blue lines, your safe single engine rate of climb speed. That is the speed that you need to obtain as a minimum and a maximum in the event of a takeoff, in the event of an engine failure on takeoff. Here's what blue line airspeed looks like in a light twin. VYSE, your best single engine rate of climb. And as an airline pilot, this is something you practice over and over and over in the simulator. It's called a V1 cut or an engine failure at a critical phase of flight, right as you're rotating, right as you're breaking ground from takeoff. The FAA needs to evaluate each and every commercial pilot, air transport pilot rated pilot, to make sure that he can properly handle an engine failure at such a critical phase of the flight. Of course, in airline training, you're doing this all in full motion simulators. In lighter twin engine aircraft, you may be getting this training at, in the aircraft itself, or you can get this training at flight safety in simulators that are not full motion. For an engine failure on takeoff, you're gonna to need to go through a process that goes similar to this. Again, this is just a broad overview. This is not intended for training purposes. Identify, verify, feather, and secure. First, you're going to need to identify which engine has failed. Then you need to verify which engine has failed, typically by pulling back on the power lever on the bad engine. Then you need to get that bad engine feathered, to get the propeller feathered into the wind to reduce the aerodynamic drag on that dead engine. And then eventually secure that engine by going through the entire engine failure checklist. The entire time, you need to be continuing to fly the aircraft and you need to fly the aircraft at blue line airspeed. You don't want to go much faster than blue line airspeed because you may not have the excess performance to climb out at a much higher speed and you certainly want to fly no slower than blue line airspeed. Because eventually, if you allow your airspeed to decay, you will enter VMCA, minimum controllable airspeed in the air at which time that the adverse yaw from a twin engine aircraft will overtake you, will not have enough rudder authority to counteract the adverse yaw of the asymmetric situation and you will lose control of the aircraft. Here's what VMCA looks like in an early model Queen Air Recip. climbing out at a very low airspeed once the left engine fails, adverse yaw produced by the right engine gives you the two ingredients for a stall and spin.
Here's an example of a crew experiencing an engine failure below VMCA and instead of rejecting the takeoff, electing to continue with the predictable results. So regarding these last two King Air crashes, the one in Hawaii with the skydiving early model King Air and this most recent one in Addison, Texas, we're not sure yet whether these have been engine failures on takeoff, but to those of us that have been around a while, it sure looks like it. So now let's go look at a uh, CAL FIRE King Air and talk about some King Air specific safety features that are built, in, built into the aircraft to help you in these sort of situations. Thousands of these King Airs have been built over the years and they've got a great safety record and I want to talk about a couple of safety features that are built into the King Air to help you in the event of an engine failure on takeoff. One of them is auto feather. When the King Air senses an engine failure, it will automatically feather the props and that's the condition that you see these Hartzell propellers in right now. This is the feathered position to minimize aerodynamic drag. Every time you shut down the King Air, the props return to this feathered position. Here's what auto feather looks like in the air. An additional safety feature the King Air has is rudder boost to give you a little bit of rudder trim into the direction that you need to counter effect the adverse yaw encountered during an engine failure. Now let's talk a little bit about critical engine. Looking at the aircraft from the rear, both propellers turn in the clockwise direction. As the aircraft takes off and climbs, high angle of attack, the propeller on the descending blade is achieving a greater angle of attack than the propeller blade on the ascending side. Thus, the thrust of the engine is offset slightly to the right. If you look at that on both engines, the moment is going to be greater on the right engine, thus making the left engine the critical engine. That is, when the left engine fails, it's a little more critical of a situation because you have greater moment of adverse yaw produced by the right engine due to this P factor. And in the King Air design, rudder boost is applied as required to help counteract the effects of adverse yaw in the event of an engine failure. Here's a simple force diagram showing the different moment arms produced by this P factor in a light twin. Here's an illustration showing P factor in a propeller driven aircraft while climbing. There's some great detailed presentations on YouTube about this that I'll present in the comments below. One way of designing your way out of a critical engine is to have counter-rotating propellers like the P-38 Lightning designed by Lockheed in World War II. So I hope this helps give you a better, broader understanding of the two recent King Air accidents that have been in the news recently, and as well, it, general understanding of some of the basic concepts that go on with every multi-engine aircraft takeoff. See you here.